Will you come with me to the book of Luke, chapter 15? Book of Luke, chapter 15. We actually tell, uh, the, uh, there's a parable there about the prodigal son. And in that par par parable, the son goes to the father and says to the father, I wish you die soon so I can get you inheritance. Isn't that what he's saying? When do you get inheritance? When you die. So if, he, if the father's still alive and the guy is asking for the inheritance, what is he actually saying by default? I hope you die soon. Man, that vegetarianism is making you live so long, you're not dying, man. I hope you die soon so I can get you inheritance. And the father goes to the son and says, Okay, well, I'll tell you what, man. You're headed into the way of worldliness. That's not the way I brought you up. So therefore, you want to go to the city and leave the country living? Go. But don't call back. I'm no longer your father. You're no longer my son. I only have from now on one son. Is that what the story says? Ah, oh, okay. Just checking. Well, you want to go? You go. You're still my son. But I hope nobody at church talks and inquiries to me about you because I wouldn't know what to do. You are an embarrassment to the family. I can't have the strife face to go now to church. Everybody's going to point their finger at me and say, what about father he was that obviously he must have done something wrong because his child is in the world. Is that what the parable says? Who gave the money to the prodigal son? I beg your pardon? Why? Son, this is the money. And I'm going to tell you something. I've got faith in you. He knows he's going to misuse it. He knows he's going to waste it. I've got faith in you. But if anything happens, if anything happens, you're welcome home. You can come home anytime. Even in two weeks on the track. Don't let pride deceive you. Don't let pride tell you that your father won't take you back. If anything you're going to remember, I want you to remember something. Remember this. I am your father. I will never leave you, never forsake you. My love is everlasting towards you. Thank you, father. And those words were ingrained there by God through his spirit. Can you come with me to verse 17 of chapter 15 of Luke? Verse 17. And it says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy highest servants. When he came to what? He came to who? To what? He came to himself. How? I mean, who witnessed to that boy? The pigs? Who witnessed to that boy? The Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit doing with that boy that is deep into sin, is feeding the pigs, the most degrading job for a Jewish man? Is wearing rags and so far from God. What is the Holy Spirit doing in there? How did the Holy Spirit arrive there? Somebody was praying. Someone was praying. And as the prayer was broadcast to heaven, Jesus Christ bounced it back to the one that had ears to hear. And he came to himself. And he remembered. Why did he remember to come back home? Because it's only the Holy Spirit that brings remembrance all the words as spoken. He didn't come up with another idea. Oh, I'll probably try this. No, no. He came up with the idea. I'll go back home. Why? He remembered the father's words. And he goes back home. 
he goes back home and the father sees him from afar. Do you know why? Because love sees at a distance. And we normally keep the distance with people rather than love them even at a distance. And he comes to the father and he comes to the father and the father just embrace him. And this guy is broken, absolutely broken, absolutely repentant. And then he says to the father, Father, I am no longer to be called your son. Mm. And the father stops him. Have you noticed that when the, fa- when, when the son is about to say his speech, he never is given the opportunity to say, make me like one of your servants. Never given the opportunity. Never, the father never says, okay, well, you want to come back, you start from the lowest, lowest, and you earn your, your position back. Never heard from the father. The father stopped him. There's a wonderful book called Christ Object Lessons. You read it in there. The father stopped him and did not allow him to continue. No, 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 no. You are my son. You are my son. And tomorrow... The next day, the son is working in the field as a son, and he's looking at the father. The father is just walking there on the field, and he's wondering, when is, is the father going to tell me, I told you so? And he never came. And the next day, and for a whole week, he's expecting, when is he going to tell me, now, are you happy to be back? Uh, better than the pigs, was it? Yeah, and obviously you... Now, I'm just grateful, you should be grateful now that I'm taking you back. Okay, it's fine, I love you, and so forth. Make sure that I say I love you, because I'm a Christian. But, you know, isn't that better than with the pigs? Yeah. And the son never hears it. And he's wondering, it seems like my father has divine amnesia. (laughs) Divine Alzheimer's disease. What is the difference between the divine and the earthly Alzheimer's disease? Well, the earthly Alzheimer's disease remembers very well the things of the past, but forgets the things of the present. The divine forgets the things of the past and remembers the promises of today. That's divine Alzheimer's disease. Because when the Lord wipes away our sins, they are down deep in the bottom of the ocean. True? Wow. Would you be able to press the pause button on that story as we launch into this testimony? And we'll close it as we press play after we talk about these two beautiful girls here. The two are sisters. Do they look like sisters? Well, one is a a Mapuche Indian. The other one is European, full-blooded European background. One is actually fairly much Indian color. The other one is fairly much fair color. But nevertheless, they're still sisters. They're still sisters. We're going to tell you the story of both of them. Remember, we are on pause on the story. The first one, her name is Veronica. And it's a beautiful Girl, in fact, I look at her and I just fall in love with her. It's amazing. If she wasn't my wife, I would marry her. <laughs> she was born in Chile, in a, in a town called Curacaví, near Santiago. And she was the fifth child of this Adventist family. The mother actually became an Adventist halfway through, I think, the second child or so forth. And uh, when she delivered the fourth child... Remember, she was the fifth one. When she delivered the fourth child, she was told that she had cancer in the uterus. And then this beauty was conceived two years later. Can you imagine when David says, I was conceived in sin? There is in the same place, the same uterus, the cancer growing and a baby growing facing. Remember how these people say that the woman's womb is the safest place on earth? For this beautiful girl, even the mother's womb was a foreign place. Was a place where she could actually behold sin and cancer. When she was born, the mother almost died. She went and extended her life through through the natural pharmacy that God has provided for us. But two and a half years later, she actually died. 
And this is the photo of the exact day when she arrived to her new adopted family. She was two and a half years of age, and she was the only one given in adoption. The others were not. She was the only one, the ugly duckling, given in adoption. The other brothers and sisters uh, will end up growing together. They were placed with family and friends in the, in, to start with, and then they will end up having memories together. But this beauty was given into adoption into a Seventh-day Adventist family. That's her, and that's the uh, proud Spaniard that she married to. <laughs> so there I am, conquered by the beauty and the charming character of this girl. She was far from the Lord at that point. We got married soon after. She says to me, the Lord wants me to start keeping the Sabbath again. And I went through my marriage papers, <laughs> and I said, I don't remember saying I do on that one. <laughs> but guess what? I could not live without her. She started going to Sabbath school. She started going to sermons. And I was there in the home, bored as a total, you know, not knowing what to do. So you know what I did? I started going with her. And when I walk into a class and they, they started asking questions on prophecy, you know, what happened in, uh, in 538, Nobody rose their hands. I looked at my wife and said, you people doesn't even know your own doctrine. Give me that book. What was it called? It's called The Great Controversy. Give it to me. I'll read it. I'll teach them a lesson. <laughs> she bought for me a Bible. I read it to cover, from cover to cover, and I will go all armed to the Sabbath school class. You know that annoying person that always, you know, is rising their hand and Correcting everybody, that was me. <laughs> totally unconverted, full with pride, not even baptized. A Christian, yes, but not baptized. And I was criticizing everybody. Until a phone call came to my home. And a soft voice of a non-friend non said to me, Oscar, you know so much now because you are hungry for reading and you're a great reader, you have already read Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, uh, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, uh, Great Controversy, you have read the, the Bible from cover to cover, you know everything better than us. But you are missing Jesus. And in that night, I knelt down with this beauty and I gave my heart to the Lord. So he got baptized and I was present. I got baptized, so she was rebaptized, and I was present, and I got baptized, and she was present. Amen. I'll tell you, the life of this girl wasn't an easy one. And because we're not here to broadcast the devil's crimes, we will just say that she's gone, she went through a childhood where many things happened to her that should never happen to a young girl. Mm, and we move on. So it wasn't easy. By the age of 17, she hated God. She came from a very legalistic environment too, which added to all the crimes of the devil committed upon her. She had enough reason to be angry, right? She had enough excuse to be upset with everyone and God. Praise God for His salvation. You see her today, and you will not believe what she has gone through. You have not, you wouldn't have any idea that she's gone what she went through. No idea. She has a big smile, hospitable to everybody, and always charming and happy. No resentment with anybody. She doesn't hate anybody. You know why? Because she has found Jesus. A few years ago, she receives an email, opens the email, and says, Hi, my name is Richard. The email was written in Spanish. My name is Richard. I am your brother. I would like to get to know you. 
she went and deleted that email and went to talk to me and said, I don't feel anything for the Blatt family. As far as I understand, you know, they are having their lives. I don't have any resentment against God. I know that He has given me a beautiful family, beautiful children, but really I don't have anything. A few months after, she opened up a Facebook account to actually send photos to my mom in Spain and opened it one day and it was a friendship request. Hi, my name is Richard. I am your brother. She made him a friend. One day she had the little red light on the Facebook and he had the little, little red light on the Facebook. Hi, this is Richard, your brother. Hi, how are you? And for the next year, through Skype and Facebook, they started communicating. My wife came to me one day crying. And she says, I love these people. I love my brothers and my sisters. Why? I said. Because they have shown me that the, I was always loved by them. Why is it that we love Jesus? Because he first loved us. And all of a sudden, he looked at me and said, I don't know what's going on in me. I just love these people. What about your father? I just love my brothers and sisters. <laughs> what, I want, what, what about the one that signed and gave you away in adoption? You know, I'm so looking forward to seeing my brothers and sisters. This is 32 and a half years after. The baby was back home. See, for her, she lived her life in the new adopted family and forgot about them. For them, she was the baby. The baby was taken away from us. The baby, where is the baby? They will pray for the baby. They're all Christians at, to a certain degree, I should say. But, you know, they had a good, good a spiritual heart. And the baby was back home. And the baby goes and says to the older brothers and sisters, I want to see dad. I want to see our father. Oh, look, he's a strange man. Some people believe that he lost his mind when he lost his wife. Well, think about it. 30 years of age, five children, Chile, Pinochet in power. Devastation and anger, no central link, no social security. You need to go out and work. Who is going to look after, you, after your children? Some people say that our dad lost his mind. I need to see him. Why? Because I need to give him a hug and tell him, as Joseph of old, that that, that the devil intended for evil, God has used it for good. As he shared up to 4 o'clock in the morning with the brothers and sisters, she had the opportunity, the baby had the opportunity to tell them, these four brothers and sisters, to tell them, I want to be the answer to my mom's prayer. What do you mean, baby? Our baby? Mi niña la llama. They call her mi niña. Have you heard of El Nino? That's the child. Mi niña, the little girl child. What do you mean by answering our mom's prayer? Well, my mom, I believe that she was a believer. And as she was dying, I believe she actually, as any mother will do, Father, I, wanna, I want you to protect my children and take them to heaven. I want to be there when mom gets up from her sleep. And tears were coming out, out of the older brothers and sisters. She saw dad, gave him a hug. That man was so stiff. Because even the others were not forgiving. 
And the one that needed more to have against him was the one that gave him the big hug. Do you know why? Because there is a savior in heaven that wants to purify his people and wants to make them experience in forgiveness. There was a reunion with the cousins. So the baby were able to actually have a relationship with the cousins too. Since then, they speak on Skype, they, 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 they uh, send letters. My wife has been there already twice, and we are going to tell you about the second time right in a minute. So this is Teresa. We've been praying for her for a long time because she had it tough too. You see, friends, we are living in a society and in a world that is enough evil for you to have your share and for me to have my share and for Teresa to have a big share of it, too. So I don't know what your circumstances were in the past or what the circumstances are now while you're sitting here, but I can, I can assure you there's, there is enough evil in the world for everybody to have a piece of the, of the cake. So Teresa is all excited for Veronica and said, oh, I'm so jealous for you. So jealous for you. Because you have found your family. And all of a sudden, now you have two families. See, the adopted one that loves her to pieces. And the blood family. You say that your older brother is a policeman, a carabinero in Chile. You say, yes, he is. Look, I wonder if he can actually find a... A family, uh, a family member of mine. You see, Teresa comes from South Chile, Mapuche by skin, Indian Mapuche. At the end, she was, uh, she was the daughter of two doctors, a uh, 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 husband and a wife, both of them doctors. At the age of three, the father, the doctor, died. Three years later, at the age of six, she was standing before the hole that was lowering the casket of her mother. And for 42 years, she had continuous nightmares very often of that image. She was then given into adoption. Guess where? Into the same house that my wife Veronica was given into adoption. Same house. That's why I said in the beginning they were sisters. They endure happy moments together and unfortunately, only for the devil's credit, unfortunately, they went through the same issues together. The same issues that, they should, that a beautiful girl should never have gone through. By the age of 17, she just had it. Continuous nightmares. Now the issues, nightmares. The mother lowering down as a casket, nightmares. A legalistic environment, nightmares. Well, we might as well, if this is what I am, let's go to go and leave it. So she just went and leave it. Leave the nightmares. Let's go to leave it. Like if I'm a naughty boy, if I'm a naughty girl, Everybody's telling me about it. I've been reminded by the devil about it. We might as well be an naughty boy, right? Or be an naughty girl. Well, we've been praying for Teresa so much. When she, she was in our house, she was even struggling to kneel down and pray. She wouldn't pray. She knows how to, but she wouldn't. And we prayed and prayed every day for Teresa. We didn't have any idea what the Lord had stored to change her heart. No idea, never brought to our minds the amazing thing that the Lord was going to do to Teresa. As she became an orphan, a family member older than her looked after her for a while and then she was placed into adoption. So this family member receives a knock on the door down in Chile from two policemen and said, hi, we've got a family member of yours that lives in Australia and wants to get in contact with you. I don't have anyone living in Australia. Teresa. Teresa. Yes, this is my mobile number. Give it to her. So those, those policemen gave it to, to, to um, my wife. My wife passed it on to Teresa. And Teresa gets one of those cars to call Chile. 
And she goes and calls Chile to this lady after 40 something years. And they just cry, oh, you call back, and they cry for 10 minutes trying to, how was your life? We have many things to say, and so on. And then 10 minutes into the conversation, friends, this family member goes and says to her, I haven't seen your mom for a while. They tell me she's been sick. What? You were at the burial. My mom, a doctor, my father, a doctor, he died when he, I was three, she died when I was six, and I saw the casket going, going down. Oh, you don't know the story. What story? They were not your parents. What? Your mom was a deaf woman, Mapuche Indian, that lived up in the mountains. She got pregnant out of wedlock. And the shame in town caused us to go down to the bigger town city down the valley. She started working for the ones that you thought were your parents, for a father doctor and a mother doctor. They could not have children. And when they saw that lady with that baby to be, to be born, deaf, illiterate, they changed the papers and they put their surname to yours. What? Oh, your father is also alive. They live together. None of them actually got married. They live in the next village next to each other. You meant to tell me that all this that I am, all of a sudden, I am not? You meant to tell me that I, I'm not an orphan? Is that what you're saying to me? You're not an orphan. You have a mother and you have a father. And you were stolen from them. She calls to Veronica. And we just went, wow. My mom called us. We told the story and my mom says, what am I doing is wasting my time with soap operas. I might as well just call you guys and you'll just give me the latest. Veronica says, you need to go. You need to go and meet them. I'm upset, Veronica. I'm upset. Why did God do this to me? It's not God. God is bringing you together. And you should... To know Teresa before and after those news is to know black from white. You know, a few weeks later, she's calling and she's all excited. She's booking tickets for herself and for my wife. She's all excited. She's going back to meet her dad and mom. And she's all nervous because all of a sudden she didn't have any family and now she has two. The adopted one and the mom and dad. And they arrived to a town and they booked somebody with a four-wheel drive to transport them up to the mountains. They are going to visit that first. She's all nervous. Can you imagine 42 years? you never seen your dad. You thought you were an orphan. And now all the things that you thought to be true are not actually true. All the anger and resentment that you had, all of a sudden you have a beautiful gift given, bestowed upon you by God, and you're wondering, oh, well, I suppose I should not be that angry with him anymore. That man was actually advised that the daughter was found six months prior. Six months prior, that man was actually advised that the daughter was found. Do you know what this man, simple man, did? He killed a chicken every day and cooked a meal because the daughter was coming. Every day, this man, they said, oh, we found your daughter, she's coming. Now, in her mind, I mean, Australia is too far of, 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 his, of his understanding. So, my daughter is coming, she cooked a chicken and prepared a meal for the daughter that was going to come. That's her. This is after 42 years. Why do you take so long? He said. 
Why did you take so long? Can you notice the, the hat? She, she brought a little present from Australia. There is an old lady, Mapuche Indian, living in the high in the Andes. Her child was stolen from her. She was asked to pack bags and go back to her village with no child. Every morning, according to the record of the neighbor, every morning she had a ritual. Every morning she had a ritual. She will actually leave her house, walk up a little hill, and from the top of that hill, she will look down and will, stay, uh, will be staring down for about five to ten minutes every day. And then she will go back to her house and do her things. One day the neighbor asked her, why are you doing that? Why are you little Indian Mapuche mother go all the way up the hill at a certain time of the day you know what she said? She said, one day, God is going to bring my daughter walking back to me. And this is part of her routine. This is the photo taken on the same day when she is about to do that. Her eyes. She's just been told who is coming. Is, is she? Is she? Remember, she's deaf. Just notice now what she does. She realized there's a camera there. And notice what she does. Just notice. She from me. She's my daughter. Look now. Look, look. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Luke 15, verse 28. Luke 15, verse 28. The father is not bringing any accusation against the son. And you know what the father said to the son? Why do you take so long? I've been waiting for you. But there's a brother. Listen, there's a brother, older brother. Luke 15 verse 28 says this, and the older brother was what? Was what? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Was what? Angry. The older brother was angry. Can I ask you a question? Did the older brother walk in the house with the father and his brother? No, he didn't, friends. He didn't. The older brother was angry and he missed the party. And he missed the banquet. And he never got in. Is it so valuable, the anger that you have against somebody? Is it so valuable that you're ready to exchange it for heaven? He was angry. And that anger kept him outside of salvation. Is the Lord refining his people? The older brother was angry. And he said to the father, your son came. And the father says, if you call him your son, my son, 
that makes you know his brother. Did you understand that? If you call him your son, that makes you know his brother. You should see Teresa now. She's all excited. She's going to build a house for mom. She's going to do renovations. She is praying, friends, because she has realized of something. That God loves her. I'm going to, what a deep theology is that, isn't it? It's just amazing. You know that there's among certain Christian circles, if you say that God is love, they think that love, the word love, is a swear word. Oh, are you one of those liberals? What? Oh, God is love, God is love. Oh, yeah. Cheap theology. What is the center of the gospel? Is the root of our salvation. And if you don't love your brother, you don't understand how much God loves you. If you have resentment in your life, and I'll tell you, I don't know your life, but these two girls had it tough. I know their lives. And they had it tough. And if these two girls can look at God and say, thank you for restoring our vessel. And if my wife can go to the husband, or to, 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 to her own father, and give him a hug, go to all the people and give them hugs, and pray for them in her own prayer list, I'll tell you, it is not about, I can't do it. It's about you not seeing Jesus' cross in your mind as it should be seen. To close now, just going to bring a little gem of what the Lord showed me a few years ago as I was talking with a friend of mine and his wife. We were discussing around a table. And we talking about it, about God's glory. And we read in, in, uh, in Exodus 30, 33 when Moses is saying, show me your glory. And God says, you cannot see my glory and live. Where is the glory of God manifested? In the cross of Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians tells us. In the cross of Christ, that's where the glory of God is manifested. Oh! Lord, show me your glory. And Jesus says, you can't see my glory and live. Can I? No. Then Lord, show me your glory that I might die. So many of us Struggle to die to self. Could it be because we're not seeing him in his glory? Could it be because we have missed focus and we're not looking at that cross where the glory of God is manifested? So we can finally die to this sinful being that we are, recognize that we are absolutely nothing and everything has been forgiven. And we draw from that forgiveness that He gives us in plenty, plenty measure and share it around. Give as you've been given. If you have been forgiven, give. But you don't want to be the angry brother, do you? Anger has no reason to exist. If you justify it, you are not justified by Christ. You justify it by your own devices.